are living on a giant spinning ball, rotating around the sun, which is floating through the universe. A ball. We will now present you a different perspective. The Earth is flat and stationary, surrounded by a circle of ice that contains all the oceans, from where the sparkly vault of the firmament raises, under which rotate sun and moon in circular orbits very similar to each other. This model, known as the Flat Earth, is way far from what the modern man is able to accept. Let's see why. Recently, Obama and Hillary Clinton have talked about Flat Earth. Uh, yeah, they, 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 they must have been founding members of, of the Flat Earth Society. They, they would not have believed that the world was round. They are basically the current protagonists of the crew, which for centuries guarantees dominion of the world to a few. They talk about it, avoiding the argument with the satire method. Isn't flat. Which is the treatment of mocking and discrediting everyone that questions any official versions. Gravity. As always, we will venture into the role that most might define wrong. Francis Bacon, the new organ, 1620. Truth uncovers faster from mistakes than from confusion. The flat earth argument exploded in 2015, quickly divulging on the web, dragging in researchers and average people. Thomas King's experiment will show you why, in his most famous work, The Structure of the Scientific Revolutions. According to the philosopher, science doesn't progress because of the new discoveries and inventions, but the mutation of the paradigm happens through revolution. Like the social ones, the scientific revolutions are announced by the increasing intolerance in the existing order. In this particular case, scientists feel that the old paradigm has stopped working but can't easily let go of it and rather obstruct research. Scientists from both sides will exhibit accusations of heresy, today called conspiracy, or orthodoxy, negating. Every scientific revolution is not just incompatible, but often unmeasurable with what preceded it. And it's the unmeasurableness that explains why passing from a paradigm to another can't happen gradually, nor can it come from logic or from a neutral experience. It has to happen all at once, in a revolution. What we see, sure enough, depends both on what we look at and what the previous visual concept experience taught us to see. Our generations for centuries have the omnipresent spinning ball concept impressed as the only possibility for us to exist. Anything that is not included in this paradigm is out of any chance, out of society, of logic, of the world. Yet, the globalist elite is pleased to reveal the flat earth model. Freemasons have an obligation to truth that they adhere throughout symbols and messages disseminated everywhere. In movies. in cartoons. On the web. On the Illuminati card. Under Ground Zero. And in the United Nations logo. And if they don't know what the shape of Earth is, who does? Today, the current model that sees the terrestrial sphere rotating around the Sun 
a million times larger in a galaxy of millions of stars, in a universe of millions of galaxies, is rapidly entering a crisis. We can't yet know if this crisis will turn into a scientific revolution that will subvert the model, but the breaking points of the system seem to be unequivocally emerging. Before exposing them, a prefix. All the information in the astronomical field come exclusively from the deceptions of the space agency monopoly. These, careful not to contradict each other, have a common dominator, as common is the vector in all their logos. Every image, testimony, experiment, information, exploration and scientific hypothesis about Earth and what surrounds it is born or created here under the vector's protection at the expense of the worldwide contributor. We will complete this prefix with the explanation of Robert Simon, the NASA employee that created the last blue marble model we have available. Where it was low, I colored it dark blue because they're low mostly in mid-oceans. And then where it's a little bit higher, it was like a little bit brighter green. There's a small problem with it because there's a very slight gap in between each orbit. It is photoshopped. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. Then? There was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Just what I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space. But I've looked at these images over and over again, trying to sort of get the essence of it. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's, it has to be, has to be. It is photoshopped, it is photoshopped, but it's, but it's, it has to be, has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's, has to be. So the image of Earth that we have available is reconstructed, altered, composited, in a precise word, fake. What does it take to create fake digitals when you have the best technology on hands? All it takes is a blue screen or a zero gravity plane and you're on. Here's what they purposely show you from the camera that is filming ex-President Bush's visit at NASA. A freshly modified image and a chromatic screen. The chromatic screen is an instrument used to substitute the color of the background with any scenarios. In CGI, computer generated image, you can access the island, excuse me, the ISS that isn't there. The trick consists of letting air bubbles float. Here is the game and here's the trick. They show it to us themselves. Or we can take a walk on space. Let's take the Chinese and we have bubbles here too traveling undisturbed. Could they be in an exercise swimming pool? You can create a puppet out of nowhere when the insolence has no limit, or show the hidden side of the moon when the bad taste is without shame. All rigorously modified, digitalized, fake. Why not show authentic pictures? Probably because they don't exist. Till this day, it is not possible to have an authentic picture of Earth. We can just see the comparison of the sizes they show us to understand they don't even have the same reference. Supposedly, a scientist took this picture in space, but all you have to do is raise a little the luminosity and we find out the trick. A rectangular cut, this image has been added. Whichever interpretation you want to give to the vector, that comes in the space agency logos, scientists that operate there act confirmed to each other, like scoundrels of a grotesque Masonic farce, each one with a role. Christopher Retti, between a shampoo and an evolution, shows herself with a chemtrails normalizing number. Adam Stelzner plays the role of the leader on Mars Attack, where we seem to find a little of all. Bones, Grand Mars Ladle, rats, unless that they are not, like very likely, images tinted red, photoshopped, fake. Surely not published by mistake, but voluntarily used as a stress test for our minds that in front of such an obvious fake perpetrated from our authorities, we will be increasingly ready to accept it. Cognitive dissonance. And Obama, who wants to achieve technologies to overpass the radioactive Van Allen belts and Sandman for 
the first time past the lower orbit. But wait, didn't the United States already done this mission 50 years ago? Landing on the moon with a lamb cam and foil kept all together by tape? This material is so insolently fake that either they are crazy creating this staged reality or we are dumb believing it. Both the information monopoly is well coordinated with a world of school, science, politics and is miraculously able to insinuate contradictions so big in the perception of reality that almost no one dares to look at them. Eric Kobler says, the human being is an information system with the consequence that it can be healed through information. This is what we are trying to do now, talking about the shape of Earth. Here's everything that doesn't add up in the current spherical model. Let's try to explain it to a child that asks, why don't the people in the South Pole fall off? Because gravity keeps them to the ground, answers the school teacher. And from that day the child will want nothing more to know of this ancient intuition, original, sacred doubt. If he tried in adult age, he would be invaded with such a quantity of formulas and mathematical equations to get struck forever. The force of gravity is a theory, not reality. What passes for law of gravity can be explained with the concepts of density and buoyancy. An object denser than air will fall towards the floor, one less dense will tend to float. Let's hear what Einstein says about Nikola Tesla, one of the greatest and noble geniuses of all times. How does it feel to be the smartest person on earth? Well, you should ask Nikola Tesla about that. Now let's hear what Tesla says about gravity. The theory of relativity wraps all these errors and fallacies and clothes them in magnificent mathematical garb, which fascinates, dazzles and makes people blind to the underlying errors. The theory is like a beggar clothed in purple, whom ignorant people take for a king. Its exponents are very brilliant men rather than scientists, but they are metaphysicists. Researcher Anthony Pasch wrote what has errantly labeled as gravity are actually magnetic force lines. And in fact, the electromagnetic universe as described by Tesla and occulted by the theory of gravity is what they actually work in on at CERN. But what they tell us is that the force of attraction should push us towards the nucleus of Earth. But who's ever seen this nucleus? when the maximum perforation depth achieved by man is barely almost 8 miles, just the depth of Earth crust. So what are they talking about? The nucleus, for what they can show us, doesn't exist. Surely, in a subverted paradigm when the law of gravity will have to disappear, scientists will adapt to other laws, maybe to the density ones, or the electromagnetic ones and the kids will be able to finally see the upside-down man fall off. Because the law of gravity is just the theoretic instrument to justify the impossible roundness of the terrestrial surface and hide the true physiognomy of the universe. Dear child, they told you that the Earth is spherical. Okay, but can you see it? Who knows? Surely not looking at the horizon. Nor from the window of a plane. Or from an amateur high altitude balloon. As you can see, in all these cases, Earth is evidently flat. Yeah, sure. You might see it in an altered images from NASA, but we analyze this in the prefix. They are artifact, CGI, or filmed with a deforming fish island. Here's NASA's globe rotating with motionless clouds. 
This is the time lapse of the terrestrial lights with a lot of special effects on lights. Storms, aurora borealis, ridiculous. And here's an example of a fish eye earth. So, it's all artifact. So, where can we see the curvature? Not from the ISS shuttle, that doesn't exist. We already acknowledged, it's a movie set. We can observe a plane flying, it could be a drone, it's and a trick. All of that happened in a little town called York, Maine, across the United States from where we're talking to you right now. And all of that happened in a little town called York, Maine, across the United States from where we're talking to you right now. We would be willing to believe it, only if during a live feed, an astronaut decided to show us what is visible from the porthole of the shuttle. I repeat, in live feed, surely not in the scenes treated in post-production. Otherwise, we stay in the computer graphic field. Should we see the sphere from satellites? What satellites? The ones described from the pen of the science fiction author Arthur Clarke that invented them in 1945. Yes, because satellites are an editorial product and were realized only 20 years later by NASA. But till this day, we don't have credible images of the construction of a single satellite or of the ISS. Hands on data, today we should have in orbit about 20,000 satellites but no one has ever ascertained their presence, verified a possible collision or fall, the blacklit passage observing the moon, never seen, neither from Earth nor from space, excluding the images elaborated with computer graphics. Good morning. This is the last picture from our so-called satellite on Italy. And yet, we should believe that similar objects can resist at the temperatures of the thermosphere and exosphere till over 3600 degrees Fahrenheit. But doesn't aluminium melt at 1220 degrees Fahrenheit? Inacceptable. It's more likely that satellites have stayed the outcome of a riotous fantasy and the lie of an unscrupulous power that has been dealing illusions for decades, making madness out of public money. In a subverted paradigm model, maybe we'd see these invisible hordes of satellites fall off too. Also because today, all telecommunications are realized by a million of miles of optical fiber cables and radio bridges are present everywhere in our territory. After all, it should be easy to verify the existence of satellites all they would need to do is turn Hubble around, for example, make it first Earth, and show us the center of an American city on live feed. They never do it. They can't. They would first have to take it up in orbit. But first, there would have to exist an orbit around a spherical Earth, which is in fact put up for discussion in the flat Earth model. Here, our Earth is not the board they told us. So let's see what it is. Well, what it could be, since we are talking about models. Sure enough, we do not want to abandon the terrestrial sphere to embrace the Suseya crystal ball, but we are obligated to flank to the prudence of details, the courage of vision. Also because if the idea of the globe falls, Freemason Newton's gravity falls too, like Freemason Darwin's evolution that makes a man and nothing at the drop keel of infinite space. Exactly Darwin indicated in the Protocols of the Wise from Zion as one of the skeleton keys to weaken the non-Jews, proclaiming their brains to the fakery that it's all a coincidence and that we are grains of dust with no importance. Let's get back to our Earth. Every object that disappears at the horizon ends up beneath Earth's curvature. This is what conventional science says by daddy's mouth to the child that faces the sea for the first time. But it's not true. With an optical zoom, the figure that had disappeared on the horizon gets right back on sight. This is simply because the disappearance is not due to the curvature but because our sight is limited by the point of dispersion of perspective, 
over which an object gets progressively erased by our optical horizon. If the curvature of Earth was, as they tell us, 8 inches per mile square the distance, we could calculate with this graph the length of the curvature at any given distance. For example, a distance of 118 miles should give a curvature of 1.74 miles, but if this was so, how can we see from Ventimiglia Mount Sinto in Corsica, tall 1.71 miles? The point of observation is at sea level, and the distance between this plaza in Ventimiglia and the tip on Mount Sinto is exactly 118 miles. If Earth was curved, we could only be able to see land taller than 1.74 miles. But we are able to see the entire Corsica's outline, from tip to coast, unexplainable on the spherical model. The web is full of experiments like this. How is this site possible? Before accusing researchers of doing mass destruction, we gotta fix this problem. For the laws of perspective, the horizontal lines intersect at the vanishing point, forming a triangle that comprehends all of our possible line in sight. We don't see like this, but like this. Over our visual horizon, everything disappears. Just like the sun, like these buildings that will look as smaller and collapsed as they get over our prospective horizon. Obviously not because Earth is a sphere. If the collapsing of the buildings was due to Earth's curvature, we couldn't see them straight, but with an inclination. But it isn't so. The curvature is not there, in fact, it's not observable. It's not contemplated in the real world. And constructions engineers know that very well, since they never mention it in any calculation making big constructions. A geometer and engineer with 30 years of experience published on the Birmingham Weekly, all our locomotives are designed to run on what may be regarded as true levels or flats. Anything approaching to 8 inches in the mile, increasing as the square of the distance, could not be worked by any engine that was ever yet constructed. And again, Engineer Winkler was cited by Earth Review magazine about Earth's curvature, where it stated, As an engineer of many years standing, I saw that this absurd allowance is only permitted in school books. No engineer would dream of allowing anything of the kind. I have projected many miles of railways and many more of canals, and the allowance has not ever been thought of, much less allowed for. A small navigable canal for boats, say 30 miles long, will have by the above rule an allowance for curvature of 600 feet. Think of that and then please credit engineers as not being quite such fools. Nothing of the sort is allowed. We no more think of allowing 600 feet for a line of 30 miles of railway or canal than of wasting our time trying to square the circle. So, do we want to force engineers to be curving canals? How could they? Can you imagine any basin of water curved? Water doesn't curve, yells the boy with no more patience. It doesn't act like that, but like this. So, at the least, in correspondence of oceans should exist huge sweeps of water on the same level. At least there, the Earth should be flat, but they keep promoting the opposite model, a curving ocean, simply unlikely. The natural physics of water is to maintain its level. Water is even used to make a bubble, which is for leveling constructions. This, because of water, on the contrary of science, can't lie. They tell us that its curvature is due to gravity, and all this gravity that can keep the stormy ocean squished can't keep a butterfly down from its light flight? Pure mystification. Plane flights tell us even more. 
Let's check it out. At rigor of logic, a plane flying at an altitude even to the Earth's surface would have to keep pointing its nose down. This doesn't happen during flights. Why? asks the famous boy that has by now got some courage. Because gravity, always her, keeps the plane on the level curve, parallel to the ground, as if the plane was a sphere, tied to the ground with a string. Answers orthodox science. So to indulge the curvature below, there is no compensation necessary. To not indulge any curvature and proceed linearly, the pilot would have to fix the path of the plane upwards. It might be scientific for science, but it's illogic. And if a linear flight was all you needed to get lost in space, what do we need missiles for? Science and technology are so incongruent. No, it's not like this. As this persistent chemtrail along various miles shows, airplanes fly linearly and without the danger of slipping away in the universe. Let's take the flight route. In a particular case, in 2015, a flight from Bali to Los Angeles had to make an emergency landing in Alaska. But in which model would it be considered an emergency trajectory compared to this one, and the spherical one, in which the two distances seem to be very much equal? Rather, here, in the flat Earth model, it's on this surface that planes fly. This is the only way we can understand the reason for their path. This is actually this. This is this. And this again is this, and all of this simply for the economy principle. There is no airline company that wouldn't prefer the shortest and the most economic route. This silliness exists only in a virtual model, on the hands out that they serve you on the planes while you eat your peanuts. All flight paths are calculated on a similar map, because they are realized on a flat Earth. So true that no flight has ever circumnavigated Earth, north to south, the only impossible route on such an Earth that isn't a ball. An elegant way to explain Earth's curvature. Is given to us by Eratosthenes from Cyrene, mathematician and philosopher that lived in the third century B.C. Well, our boy is now a young man. He's insolent, and he takes count on that without too much reverence. How is this possible? He asks. Now, till this day, we have to exhume Eratosthenes to prove a fact as huge as the shape of our world. Simple, because these exhumers only have an handful of dust. On their hands, Eratosthenes' experiment consists on measuring a spherical Earth radius. His results was only five percent off from what is now taken for valid. He simply observed the difference of the shadows projected by the sun at noon of summer solstice in two towns, Siena and Alexandria of Egypt, that have a distance of five million stadiums between them, and thought to be on the same meridian. When at Siena the sun doesn't project any shadow at noon, at Alexandria the shadow of the gnomon makes 7.2 degree angle compared to the vertical, which is a fiftieth of a round angle. Here comes the deduction: the circumference of Earth must be 50 times the distance between the two cities, which is 25,000 stadium, 24,200 miles. Almost as much as the 24,900 miles of terrestrial circumference accepted today. In the moon landing movie, the shadows of the bodies projected from the sun on the lunar surface look divergent to each other, reported to a distance of a few meters on a plane surface. There is no need to presume any significant curvature. But if the sun was distant 150 millions of kilometers from the moon, the shadows of the objects this close should be parallel. We can only justify this 
with a close source of artificial light. We know that NASA built the moon landing at home, but what can we still observe is how on a level surface the inclination of shadows can vary with the closeness to the light source. What Eratosthenes solved presuming Earth's curvature needs to be done by calculating a much minor distance to the Sun. The flat Earth model, in fact, describes the Sun close to Earth, just like the vision of the rays suggest. And if this is fakery, as some might define it from the atmospheric refraction, it means that Eratosthenes, too, made these calculations induced in error from refraction. But it is not so. Wikipedia then states about apparent diversion of crepuscular rays invoking the effect of perspective that concentrates all of the lines at the point of optical horizon disappearance. But this shouldn't influence our perception of seeing them vertically. Perception doesn't work like this. But we see the sun rays this way and this means that their divergence is due to the nature of a multi-directional light that comes from a much smaller and closer sun than what they've told us. Structured like this, the sun creates divergent shadows like the ones measured by Eratosthenes in 5000 stadiums of space, but on a flat earth. Now, let's take care of Earth's movement and let's examine the proof of all proofs, the gyroscope, a physical instrument that is able to keep its rotation axis fixed without bothering about surrounding movements. This happens for effect of an angular movement law conservation and it's realized through the mechanical connection of the axis with the gimbal suspension. The gyroscope was used for the first time in 1852 by Léon Foucault to prove Earth's movement. Scientific chronicles report success of this demonstration. Let's see. Once you turn on the gyroscope, either manual or electric, it will keep its rotation axis fixed without being influenced by the movements around it. Here's a reproduction of the mechanism here and here. There has been numerous experiments made. While the system around it is moving, the gyroscope keeps its original axis. So gyroscopes can show us an eventual rotation beneath us. If Earth spins 360 degrees in 24 hours, the instrument would have to show its stillness over a surface doing a 360 degrees spin, giving us the mechanical, final, undeniable proof that Earth is rotating. Let's take a look. Nothing. Still. Sure looks like Earth is stationary, yet the surface should have moved in all these hours. Every experiment after Foucault has actually failed, even though our gyroscopes today are less rudimental compared to Foucault's. So it is. Gyroscopes are just like water, they don't lie. And now we understood how official science can trick the cards to avoid losing. Then we have the Coriolis effect. The scientific divulgators can't wait to point out formulas that show how this apparent force can make hurricanes and bathroom drains swirl clockwise if you wash your hands in the northern hemisphere and anti-clockwise if you wash them in Australia. Please stop! For the toilet drains, consult Wikipedia. We get it now. They make up imaginary forces and they apply them as they wish. They made Coriolis effect, 
after a bullet shot in the air that supposedly resents of the falls before hitting the ground, but not for a plane that if it resented this effect, it would have to land like this. Because nonsense can be kept in flight only until it hits the wall of reality. So let's debunk them. Hurricanes and water drains swirl both ways everywhere and planes simply land on the ground. If Earth rotated constantly, with its atmosphere going east at over 1000 miles per hour, no plane flying at 500 miles per hour could reach a destination in the east without it coming back behind the plane. Actually, if we think about it, Earth's rotation is imperceptible. Unfortunately, we don't believe what our eyes see because they have taught us an artifact system which requires believing what has never been confirmed by observation or by experiments. Remember this, no experiment has ever confirmed that Earth moves. The boy has become irreverent. He can't stand the scam of theories anymore to justify a world that he has never seen, that just isn't, not even apparently. How can we show him the paradigm that one day he might have to deal with? It's called Flat Earth, and it's a model already been described by the ancient Babylon, Egyptians, Mayans, Incas, Navajo, Norwegians, Hindus, from Buddhism, the Koran, the Bible, etc. Earth is like this, just like our eyes see it, flat and stationary, with a magnetic pole at north that always points to the pole star, an equator line along the meridians, and a perennial ice belt called Antarctica, over which is believed could be more land, or it could be where the dome of a firmament raises up our universe. This is the vault on which stars rotate in a concentric way around the pole star. Within this dome, sun and moon, with an hypothetic diameter of about 31 miles, describe a circular motion in which alternate days and seasons, hotter in the north, with the narrowing of the motion, or south, with the widening of its motion utterly. If the sun rotates above and around Earth every 24 hours, regularly moving from tropic to tropic every six months, we have the consequence that central and northern regions receive annually much more heat and solar light from southern regions along the circumference. Since the sun moves faster over the southern region in the same arc of 24 hours, it has to go over the northern region, which is smaller, proportionally slower. This explains the temperature differences from the Arctic, about minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit, and Antarctic, about minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit, the differences of the seasons and of the lengths of daylight. This explanation of the seasons formulated this way seems much more convincing than the globe model one in which seasonal differences are said to be caused by the inclination of the terrestrial axis compared to solar rays, a theory that brings the paradox result that in the boreal hemisphere, our hemisphere, will be colder while Earth is closest to the sun and warmer when it's furthest. How can a small difference in the inclination influence so much whereas the difference of 5 million kilometers influence so little. This incomprehension, the boy that is now a man, remembers that he's never solved until Obama told him about flat earth. The motion conceived in the flat model also heals the so unsustainable incongruence about the moon. The version commonly accepted 
tells us that the moon rotates around Earth with a 28-day orbit. The spherical model, though, presents quite a few problems. 1. It indicates a much smaller moon compared to the Sun, while our perception of reality shows two solid bodies of equal size. 2. To justify the fact that we only see one side of the moon, the model forces the very improbable, perfectly synchronized motion with Earth thanks to its identical periods of rotation and lunar revolutions. But if it was so, it's hard to understand what produced the craters on the visible side, since this side has always been facing us. 3. With this concept of motion, it would be impossible to see the full moon during the day, but it is something we can observe in our reality. 4. Some lunar eclipses are incompatible with this theory. He has explained the eclipse and the spherical model. The moon enters the cone of Earth's shadow that interrupts light from the sun. Let's watch. At sunset, the portion of moon being shadowed should be on top. At sunrise, it should be on the bottom, necessarily. But it is not so. Here we are in New Mexico during the lunar eclipse on December the 10th, 2011. At sunrise, the light is brightening, but the cone of the shadow on the moon is on the top. Same phenomenon observed with incredulity in Illinois at 6.30 in the morning. I find very interesting is I was expecting the shadow to come upward across the moon as it would go down and it would pass into shadow and actually it's going the other way around. In this case too, we have to choose. Either we listen to science and ignore reality or we can observe reality and give the definite kick at the spherical model. In the flat earth paradigm, the moon, whether it's a sphere, a disk or whatever, it has an orbit just a little slower than the sun, 25 hours. This is a model that seems more plausible to us. The motion indicated explains solar eclipses too, phenomenon that ancient civilizations knew how to perfectly calculate based on this flat earth plan. And now let's move on to the motion of the Sun. This one. Like sunrise is the slow motion of the Sun getting closer to us from east. Its setting is nothing more than its disappearing from our visual horizon. No curvature makes it go over the horizon. The Sun simply disappears from the point of our perspective. So once again, observing reality gives us the precise perception of things. In fact, it seems evident that it is the Sun getting closer or farther from us rotating on a flat plane that it's at the center of our universe as we see it. One of the main keys to start up the paradigm crisis is to put in light all the contradictions in the dominant spherical model together. If it was Earth rotating, it would end up with altered seasons on A and B. So going from a point to another, we should observe the inversion of days with the nights. Midnight in June should be becoming midday in December. It doesn't happen because they say every 24 hours, Earth spins one degree over, not 360, but 361 degrees. This compensation maintains the same days and nights in the two positions indicated. So the inclination of the globe remains the same, 23 and a half degrees in June as in December. Considering that the North Pole always points at the polar star, how can this happen in both moment A and B? 
distant 186 million miles from each other and with the same axis inclination. In fact, reality doesn't get along with theories, as it would on a stationary model, which describes a flat plane over which the firmament of the stars rotates around the polar star. What are the ironmongers of the spherical orthodoxy willing to invent now? The pole star is 2.55 quadrillion miles away so that we can't calculate the parallax of the stars from June to December. So, are they saying we see a star immensely distant with the naked eye? Of course they answer, because it's 46 times bigger than the sun. This is how they use measurements and numbers, bending them to resolve any invented abortive theory. This is the lesson that our boy, now old, can still learn from the words of Nikola Tesla. Today a scientist has substituted mathematics for experiments, and they wander off through equation after equation, and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. And here is what we see with a telescope. This is all we can observe. For example, this one is Venus. Cyrus. Arturo. Vega. Betelgeuse. This is how the stars are visible, and they probably answer to different density rules compared to the ones that rule our three-dimensional Earth. Basically, are we living in a system in which we are at the center while stars and planets rotate around us? Or are we the moving suburb, traveling in an insignificant solar system in the infinity of the universe? According to the globe model, we should be satisfied to be a little rock, traveling 1040 miles per hour on our own axis 66,000 miles per hour around the Sun while the solar system is moving in the Milky Way at 490,000 miles per hour and the whole galaxy is barreling in the universe at over a million miles per hour and all this without us perceiving anything. We feel air currents, water currents, the density of bodies, electromagnetism that causes earthquakes, but the ever-swirling velocity of our planet has no effect on our senses. Is that even possible? Or is it just they tell us? The proposed model of a walking Earth doesn't match with what we see in the sky. Here, the pole star is always at the center of the rotation of all the other stars, and during thousands of years, the constellations have stayed fixed at the same point without changing the position of their trajectory in any way. If Earth was a ball orbiting around the Sun, rotating in a galaxy shot out by the Big Bang, like NASA suggests, it would be impossible for our constellation to stay the same. Based on their model, we should in fact have a different sky every single night, and the visible stars would never be the same twice in a row. This is the only way we could surrender to their reasoning. But orthodox science has on hands the dominant paradigm that has been creating for the last two millennium and will use it till the impossible, till the irreversible, showing off laws made by equations that have only the purpose to make inaccessible the observation of the universe and the criticism of the imposed model. This is why after the explorations done by Admiral Byrd that with his trips detected unknown places of the ice wall chain, an international treaty closed the doors to these places to everyone. It isn't so strange that the Rockefeller family financed and promoted both the expeditions so much that they have been dedicated the name of a mountain in the Antarctic, wander in tribute to which bigger interests. The Antarctic Treaty was signed two years after the last flight and death 
of the Admiral at Washington in 1959. Today, 48 nations subscribe to the treaty that forbids military activity in the ice continent. But military personnel and equipment can be used for scientific research or any other Pacific purpose. Therefore, thanks to this, a military surveillance constantly wraps the Antarctic belt in the secrecy imposed to humanity by the worldwide supergovernment, even with violence if needed, in case civil pilots and boat captains wanted to venture in. Before calling out a disinformation, those who want to know need to fight to access the answers that the homemade moon imposters hide. If the flat earth was the dominant paradigm right now, think about how easily you would fall in the ridiculousness trying to convince others that the earth is a spinning ball, dragging clouds and oceans without anybody noticing it. Newbies inquisitors, be wise and run upon the road to knowledge, not the one of the stake. Exploring Antarctica, according to the flat earth model, could reveal the offshoot truth, the border of earth, the limit over which it encounters the firmament or the existence of new earths as described, for example, in this ancient Buddhist map. If it was so, we could assume the presence of land nearby us on a flat plain separated by ice or on plains underneath us. This could be the pavement of the universe. Today, a knowledge trip would be possible where no one else has ever gone. But what technology permits, the power for bits can't get any clearer. The ice belt under the 60th parallel has been made inaccessible. The dominant elite made it an international off-limit zone, open to limited and very expensive guided visits only, with only three totally controlled points of access. After all we know, guards are always on the border. This is what they authorized us to be thinking, that the sphere they want us to believe in is the perfect shape to hide the border of unknown lands and trap every questioning mind. Antarctica is what the myth of Hercules columns have taught us to see. The impossible limit, the knowledge wall, the access door to truth, to a new ancient truth that they are trying to delay, they want to stop, they want to prevent. And if someone tries to define it, they will provide to pollute it again, saturating the masses with lies. If Obama had the human consciousness on his heart, its well-being, the growing knowledge and of commune hearing, or even if he just thought that Flat Earth was a stupid model to disapprove, he would consent an auto-financed mission to Antarctica for a committee of a free explorers of any belief. What they are doing instead is create division. Democrats against Republicans, Flat Earthers against Heliocentrics, us against them. This is all they need to do to dominate us. They have the necessity to leave us in the shadow, to make us believe we are an insignificant dot in the universe. This is what they need the spherical model for. The dominance, moving the levers of true power, are preparing the illusion that one day we will be landing on Mars, or that maybe someone will be landing on Earth. This is what they induce. We can calmly destroy Earth, because one day we won't need it anymore. Who knows the truth? The same that obstruct others from achieving it. Maybe, since always the Jesuits are sun adulators, they have dressed it up as Christ. They have made it the core of the power managed with the financial abilities of the worldwide Zionism and through Masonic lodges, they determine what needs to be hidden and what only symbolism can reveal. In the millenary lie under which man has been a victim, they are hiding the fundamental thing why we are born. This is why we are handling Flat Earth. Decoding Earth's model answers this primary question of every man. In an extreme synthesis, if Earth is flat, it means that they purposely tricked us. They took the sense of our lives, disguising it with sacred or profane images that they gave us walking outside the churches or megastores. Removing Earth from the center of the motionless universe 
these Freemasons have physically and metaphysically took us from a place of supreme importance to a complete indifferent nihilist one. Their corporations are selling us idols to adore, slowly taking possession of the world, while we quietly believe in their science, vote their politics, buy their products, listen to their music, watch their movies, sacrificing our soul on the materialism altar. I will not talk about creators to believe in. Before believing on anything else, we need to, from right now, start to believe in ourselves, taking back the blank delegations, taking away credit to trusted raiders. They have parted men from its center to be able to be in the main throne themselves, imposing immutability to the law of the stronger. Like all other deceptions, it's useless to ask who's accomplice. Astronauts, plane pilots, politics, scientists. Of course, the winning paradigm is undisputable if you want to keep your job or your social reputation. The viable road is the one of knowledge and collective research. We will be subject to the system believers group satire. But who has a consciousness has also wide shoulders to sustain the weight. In the meantime, we have the sensor that the celestial sky is impenetrable. If they have to make everything up on this movie set, it's only because they can't access outside of it. So true that the United States and the Soviet Union have tried to violate it with subsequent operations. Atomic explosions in the atmosphere achieved who knows why after the last findings in Antarctica. But strangely enough, there is left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing. So the elite found the firmament and was trying to overpass it. But can man destroy the home that's hosting him? Can we let him do that so imprudently? What else could these destructive incursions mean if they are not tries to rip the dome apart and overpass the limit imposed to life on Earth? It seems weird talking about the dome for me too. But if Hillary Clinton does it, why can we? Why on earth should we not give voice to the ancient wisdom that depicted it or the clear impression that these pictures taken on the last mission in Antarctica arise? But we are all standing under a glass ceiling right now. What is this barrier impossible to overpass? Translucent material, force fields, the so-called Van Allen belt, they say. Something that not even a missile can overpass, that's for sure. NASA knows. Its missiles in fact prudently take a parabolic descending trajectory as they did with the shuttles. By the way, remember the accident of the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1986? Well, it seems like six of the seven participating victims, so to say, result still alive. Doesn't it look like it to you guys too? Was it the umpteenth farce made in the USA? Maybe. 
we will never know. This documentary will not end with the revelation of a truth at our fingertips. The truth that they are hiding today is common to us, even if we think differently. Maybe that's our greatness. The importance of what nature, Divine Mother, truly has been treasuring under its firmament so ineffably, which seems to exist only as one huge consciousness, an intelligence that the Divine Fibonacci Code seems to describe. Whether it's the spherical model or the flat one that best portrays it, what exists regards each and every one of us. It regards the baby that in the cradle already knew everything, then stupor by stupor has forgotten, dropped off from the weight of experience. So today, they want to make him think that the moon has been conquered, that the nucleus of Earth is attracting us, that lights so small are huge suns at unpronounceable distances. But the same ones tell us that who doesn't have a degree can't rebut and has to accept the atomic harmony that's threatening the future of life, the elimination of the entire terrestrial species on the rhythms of huge extinctions, and accept that oil gets defined as a fossil in order to sell it to us as rare and indispensable, that the chemical poison irrigated by planes passes as a vapor, so to kill us without even a perpetrator, and accept that the elite dominates reality and induces all of us to the perception of reality that best suits them. To convince us that war is good, competition is good, dominion is good, impoverishment is good, even taxation is good, or a necessary bed if you wish. This is what they are making us accept. This model can be subverted, and Earth, as we see it, is unique, alone, unequivocally the measurement of our existence. <laughs>